Welcome to another episode of the We Have a Meeting podcast. So today we are joined by one of our favorite American faces. They are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things sales as head of sales programming and host of Sell Better. They are a top sales voice and fountain of knowledge when it comes to all things selling. Today, we are lucky to be joined by the one and only Leslie Douglas. Leslie, how are you? I have never sounded so great on an intro. Thank you so much. Well, there we go. It's all down here. We start the podcast the same way every time. But in a we have a meeting first, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to ask that question second. The first question I'm going to ask you is what are your views on swimming elephants? I'm really perplexed and it's a it's a problem. Listen, I've done a lot of research and I just still can't understand the physics behind how an elephant can swim well. Tell me I'm wrong. You do you know the answer? Because because they're always wearing trunks. <laughs> no, oh sorry. Oh my gosh. Sick. <laughs> Sick. Oh. Oh, ah. so annoying that you got there first. So annoying that you got there first. Sorry, sorry. Quick witted. Oh. There we go. Yeah, f- officially. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, maybe we'll come back to the elephants later. Leslie, who are you and what problem do you solve? No one knows. I'm just kidding. My name is Leslie Douglas. And the problem I solve is um, I I think people are always looking for ways to improve or I'm always looking for ways to improve. And um, I had a mentor in the past tell me that part of your progression, you have to reach back and pull people up to where you are. And she's pulling me, I'm pulling others. Like that's part of the story and how we all move forward together and how we give back to our community. So the problem I help solve is for those people who are new into the sales world. And lately I'm dabbling into marketing and CS and um, just trying to to give back. We'll get 1% better every day. And I'm trying to do it all for free. Oh, I like it. I like it. And I'm guessing like me and Zach, when you were seven years old, you told your family, I want to work in sales when I'm older. That's right. right. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Cool. We didn't just fall into it. it. Wasn't a happy accident. Listen, I mean, I sold Girl Scout cookies. I sold, um, I used to do, I don't know. Is this a US thing? Tamagotchis. Do you know what these little like electronic yeah. pets? Okay. Okay. Just checking. I'm. You never know. Um, I used to babysit Tamagotchis on the playground. Um, I would charge for at recess. So like I've been in sales for a long time. You can really turn anything into sales. Just let's just, just quickly, just on that. You used to babysit Tamagotchis. Didn't you? I just think you shouldn't be allowed a Tamagotchi if you feel like you need to babysit it. <laughs> Everyone needs a break every once in a while, right? Yeah, but what's this like a load of stressed out eight year olds? Like, I'm sick yeah. of breastfeeding this thing. Someone else yeah. needs to take over. You got to go to school. I mean, it's hard work going to school all day, not being able yeah. to. And like, I'm the kind of kid who I could sneak away and feed your Tamagotchi and clean the poop off the screen real quick and no one would notice, you know? Wow. And I will charge for that service. You're giving, you're giving me an idea now. How can I get my children involved in the family business, Tamagotchis? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that I think me and Jack are always interested in, and I think you sit between the two, you understand the kind of British side of things as well as the American side of things. So what do you think the cultural differences are in terms of selling to an American audience and selling to a UK audience? Ooh, great question. I do think um, like the first that's pretty glaring is just the when the the serious and the fun intermingle. (laughs) I feel like um, in the States, you it's pretty serious throughout for the most part, depending on what you're selling. But there's this level of professionalism that's like required of you or expected of you almost and 
people get offended probably a little bit easier in the U.S., <laughs> But um, that's like the first one. The second one is just time off and um, taking breaks, I think. There's this, this notion of work all the time. You know, Jack just coming back from paternity leave. And I remember being in the hospital, giving labor and like checking my email to see if a deal came in. And I don't think maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe that's a personality thing, but I feel like it's also a cultural like expectation, almost uh, a product of my environment, if you will. Did that calm down at all after the baby arrived or did you maintain that? You know, I think it took me a while. Um, just recently, I, in the past couple of years, I've learned about this thing called boundaries. <laughs> it's this magical word um no but I, I think i i think it's also like your your leadership your management team who you work with who you work for and they're uh there's this hustle culture of sales and i think that's a lot of anywhere you go no matter where you live but um really kind of a, a toxic hustle culture here where it's you have to respond immediately. Email is not to, meant to be immediate communication. I think we all need to hear that again. Like mm. if you need something immediately, someone's going to pick up the phone and call you. All these other forms of communication, they're not made for an immediate response. They can wait. People can chill. <laughs> People can wait a minute. And I think that we lose that. And we're like, oh, they sent me an email 10 minutes ago. I have to respond right away or I'm going to lose the deal. Ah. Who, who or what is responsible for that, do you think? Because that does feel like a big, like all the sales influencers, Andy Elliott, Grant Cardone, the people that come out of America are very big on that. Why do you think that is such a big thing in America, that, that kind of culture? I was actually reading about this um, shift in instant gratification for humans. Like think about when we were kids and we wanted to hear a specific song on the radio. And it's like, I would sit there with my like tape recorder and my cassette tape and I'd wait for it to come on and I'd hit record. Maybe I'm much older. I don't know. Um, and I hit record and then like the DJ talks over the last 10 seconds of the song and I'd be so upset at them. I'm like, really? You just ruined my recording. But my daughter can tell any of the robots in our home or she can go online and type it in on YouTube and it will immediately come up. And so our expectations have kind of shifted as technology has shifted. And now we're looking for this instant gratification all the time. And as buyers, like as consumers, we can go on Amazon, another cultural difference, Amazon, 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 right? What do you say? Amazon, Amazon. What do you say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can order whatever we want and it will be delivered to our door the same day. Mm -hmm. yeah, like we have no experience. Like we have no waiting time, no waiting period for things. We can get practically anything we want immediately. So our buyers are conditioned to buy that way. Our sellers are now conditioned to respond that way because we think people will go elsewhere, which is where like that relationship and the value and all of those extra fancy goodies, the questions that you ask come into play. I am um, obviously America is home as Zach alluded to a couple of them there, but America is home to the Wolf of Wall Street, which is obviously portrayed we by him. we don't claim him. No, he's, he's some other state somewhere else. Um, obviously portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio, who talks about straight line selling and is typically um, associated with selling. Um, I know that from from conversations we've had cold calling in the states can get a bit of a bad reputation i mean it gets a bit of a bad reputation where wherever you go because people attach it to like ppi or something like that do you know what i mean have you been involved in a road traffic accident people think that's cold calling they don't think i'm actually gonna solve all your bloody problems so 
do do you know where the um I guess the the cultural history comes from? Like, what why is cold calling so frowned upon in the United States? Is there any history around that? I think there's two things at play. I don't know about the history necessarily. It's probably the Wolf of Wall Street. No, um, the call center piece. And there's a really fabulous documentary on Netflix. The name is escaping me, but it will come back. I promise. Um, about like these call centers and for, like a lot of them are fraud and trying to take money from people and they lie and they cheat and they steal. And that's like this whole idea behind salespeople to a lot of humans. That's what they kind of envision in body when they see a salesperson. But I think that there's this m m confusion between a call center and cold calling. And then I also think a lot of it just stems from fear. I don't like what I'm afraid what I'm afraid of. I don't want to do the thing that I'm afraid of and I don't want to be rejected. So cold calling has to be dead because I don't like it because <laughs> I tried it once and it didn't work for me. Right. And I, I actually kind of like this notion that maybe it's like frowned upon because I'm, um, I, I get cold emails, cold calls on a pretty regular basis and calls have dropped off significantly. So now I get to call people and they're going to answer because nobody calls them anymore. It's great. I actually kind of like the, the cold call dying. <laughs> that, that fear of cold calling is an interesting one. Do you, that we all go through it where there's, there's days and luckily the discipline drives you through, but you're like, Oh my God, my, my stomach's going a little bit. Do you have any like mindset hacks or anything to, to face the fear of rejection before you get ready for a calling blitz? When in doubt, dance it out. I know this sounds quite literally insane, but I put on a feel good song. Sometimes it's the same song for like a week in a row. Sometimes it changes. You just never know what I'm, what we're going to feel, right? Pick a song that you know you can't sit still. And I quite literally stand up and dance it out for the entire song two to three minutes. Now it's like, there's something about the physical shaking it out. You know, it's like you're getting all the jitters out of your body, something about moving, something about like all of these things. It's a happy song. I'm in a good mood because I think if I'm just like sitting at my desk, a lot of times I, you know, your body gets like hunched over and you're sitting there for so long and you're not knowing what's going on and you haven't seen the daylight in hours. And then you pick up the phone, you're going to sound terrible. And for me, if I feel good, if I like shake out some of the stress and some of the fear and pick up the phone, I do better typically. Not always. Not always. Typically. If the DJ's talking over the song, that's going to ruin the, the mojo. Totally ruins the flow. What, what's your go-to song? You're going to have a blitz now. I'm going to put a song on what, what we listening to. Oh, um, I mean, I have a seven-year-old daughter who plays Taylor Swift pretty much 24-7 in my house. So really like some high energy Taylor Swift is where I've been at for a while right now. Maybe a little shake it off because we're Good shaking choice. off the stress. Absolutely. Full circle. I like it. I like it. Good stuff. Okay. And then, so we've got our favorite call openers. We, we like to hit people the majority of the time our, our standard go-to is i'll be honest it's a sales call hasn't um had the same results in stateside what is your go-to call opener for anybody listening that's new and they want to start cold calling in the us of a what what should they be doing lately i've been trying oh hey jack what did i catch you in the middle of because they're probably doing something and they either laugh and say nothing, what's up, or they tell me what they're doing. And then I have some sort of insight into their life. And I can like, oh yeah, I hate a budget meeting. You getting anything good this year? <laughs> like and then, now we're having a different kind of a conversation. That's interesting. And again, that demonstrates the cultural nuance. Like even like when, I know this feels like a deep dive into we're aliens that are a different planet here, but um, when I, I did a trip traveling around America when I was 21 and I couldn't get over how like people could just jump into conversations like that. You don't have that over here. So very, 
where are you? What are your plans for the day? Where are you going from like service staff or just like people that you sat at a bar with? I couldn't imagine walking up to someone over here and, and being like that. So it, it makes sense why that would work. Um, okay. So you, you, you've probably, with the show, met lots and lots and lots and lots of different business owners and personality types. So do you think that business owners are driven by an inferiority or a superiority complex? Oh, man. I feel like majority of them, it's inferiority. Go on. Majority. But I will say there are some where I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that there's You're an it. ego. Yeah, you yeah. are the one. <laughs> so for the, for the ones that have got the inferiority, who do you think they're trying to prove something to? Probably their parents. Some, someone who hurt them in the past. I'm curious, though, why do you ask, Zach? Great question. Uh, just because everyone that we get on the podcast, it's a similar question. And normally they go, hmm, I've got like firsthand experience with someone that I can think of that's been like that. And they tend to go, actually, everyone I've spoke to has had some part of that. Um, so I just thought you'd have some nice insight with all the different people that you've met. But I might put you on the spot because people might be thinking, is she talking about me? None of them are listening. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe some of them are. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, Actually, maybe. the ones with the inferiority, yes. <laughs> yes. Right? Because we're always looking for something. Um, and I think like as a, as a business owner, like I'm sitting here and most of my drive comes from, it's like someone told me I have really specific standout moments in my head of times in my life where I have shared something in vulnerability with someone in power and they've told me either they didn't think it was a good idea, they don't think I can personally do it or I'm not capable of it. I have sound bites in my head that I like am still trying to get over. And I think that whether it's a parent or an authority figure or someone who you care about in your life, we all have, whether we're conscious of it or not, some of those things that are here driving us. And hopefully we're trying to do it for ourselves, but a lot of times we're trying to prove people wrong. Yeah. I'm going to keep going because you're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Jack used to get it a lot at the start where people would say, it'd almost be like we were children. Like we'd say what we were planning to do and it'd be like, oh, it'd be nice. A little bit of spending money for you on the side. Oh, we're oh. building like a proper business. But Jack's just moved house. So I think you've had a nice moment, haven't you, Jack, where like family have come around to your house and gone, oh, oh, wow. And that paid for this, did it? Yeah. Your little, your little part-time cold calling job. Oh, you're making some cold calls, are you? Why do people call it little? Everything, and it's always like this diminutive, like, oh, your little like side gig. But it all, mm. why do we always put little in front of it? I know, I know. There's, yeah, there's a lot in that. Okay, well, let, let's get back to um, sales skills. So we're big on actionable takeaways. So you've obviously met a lot of, industry leaders you are one yourself so in terms of looking at objections what have you learned about objections that we should be taking away and telling our listeners about i play an industry leader on tv <laughs> um, but in terms of objections i think that the best thing that i've done um like two things is pause like figuring out how to pause better in my conversations because a lot of times we wanna jump in and solve problems. And I'm sure you've been in this situation. I have jumped in to solve whatever objection they have and it actually made it worse <laughs> by me just talking and telling them what I think they want to hear or the answer to the question, but based off of my historical data, what I've heard from other prospects or clients or what I would want myself, and so now every objection I hear, no matter what, my go-to, I tell everyone that I can get to listen to me to do this. It's like pause first and always ask a clarifying question, no matter what. Like I asked you, why do you ask that? That's like such an easy one you can use almost all the time. Leslie, I'm a little concerned about implementation. Oh, implementation curious why do you ask that why are you concerned about that 
Are there any other examples? Like, like what, what the, for you as a sales trainer, what, what are the big ones that come up objection wise? Because there's obviously a, we could get into the conversation of what's an objection, what's a statement, what's a, like, but what are the big objections for you? I spent early on in a cold call. Um, I think that, you know, like, oh, we're just too small or we don't have the budget for that comes up pretty frequently. And I think that's kind of across the board for a lot of people, right? Especially right now. Um, so I think when we go to budget, I always like pause for a minute and I'm like, oh, have you seen our price list? Did I already send you the price list? And like ask you know, and it, you have to be careful, right? You have to watch your tone on that. You can't be too sassy. <laughs> Do you know how much it costs? I don't know. Like, you know. I like that. It's it's playing the uh, the dummy and things like that. Like it's, yeah. you are right about how <laughs> how sassy can you be when someone says, I'm going into a meeting. You're like, oh, you've got a meeting booked at 12 minutes past three. People don't typically book meetings for 12 minutes past three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um do you do you um do you follow a specific methodology, Leslie, or is it a, an amalgamation of things that you picked up throughout the years? Yeah, I'm big old mixing bowl of random things, and I'm constantly testing new ideas and themes and theories. I think that the only thing that I stick to consistently is um, my calendar blocking. So I only accept meetings during certain times. I set really strict boundaries around my cold calling times. So even if someone calls me inbound during that slot, I don't pick it up unless I know it's like someone who I just outbound called um, because that's my outbound time. So if my mom calls mm. during my outbound prospecting time, I don't pick it up unless she calls like three times in a row. <laughs> then I will. But I try to really if cold calling is something that you don't like to do, if we're talking about that fear again, you're going to find every reason not to do it. So I try to give myself really strict guidelines and stick to it as best as I can, or else I'm going to do everything I can to avoid it. I need to put my phone in the other room or else I'm going to open up social media and just aimlessly scroll through things and send people memes, or I need to... <clears throat> silence all my notifications. I actually close Slack. I close, like I close everything. If I have tabs open, I'm going to go scroll through all these tabs and find pictures of your sweet baby. And I'm going to send you like, I'll go write a thank you letter right now. I don't know. I'm <laughs> distracted so easy because it's something that I don't love, but I know it's so important in terms of generating revenue. Mm, okay. And then 2024 i'm i'm sure in your your sales career so far sales has changed a lot like we, we've seen so many different things like one do you know what i mean one week cold calling is dead next week cold calling is back cold emails dead cold calling cold emails back it's all changing what in 2024 in the sales world is grinding leslie's gears oh in a good way or a bad way bad way What's getting on your nerves? What's annoying you? What is everyone? What's something talking that you can't just say me and Zach? <laughs> yeah, that was my number one thing. Um, <laughs> no, I think this. There's been this really strong push around opinions and ideas, especially on LinkedIn. It's great to have all this information share, but I think that this um, really polarizing, like you have to do this and this is dead and this is alive that's grinding my gears. I feel like everyone has to be a mini scientist and try what works for them. You and I have completely different voices. We sell into different markets and different locations and there's all these different nuances, but you don't know until you try it. So someone who says that something is dead, maybe it's not working for their specific corner of the world in their industry, but that doesn't mean it's dead. It's just not working for you personally. So I really like these like really absolute feelings. I also think 2024 is going to be the year of the relationship seller. They've been poo-pooed on forever. And you're saying boo to me right now. 
I know it. I can feel it in my heart. But I'm I'm telling you like, okay, maybe this is a US thing. There's so much AI. There's so much robots and everything. I read something. There was like 70% of everything on the internet is going to be written by a robot in the next six months. And it's like, how can we be human again? How can we get back to asking for referrals? How can we get back to this connection in a different way? I feel like relationship sellers are going to come back. We're going to be revived from the dead because we were dead apparently. Don't know if you know that. Why do you think that? Curious why you asked that question, Zach. Great question. Why do you think? Anyway, we can do this all day. <laughs> um, you highlighted something really interesting, and I, I was reading about this the other day. That thing around like people have their kind of hill to die on. So it's like we're cold calling, we're email, or whatever it may be. I saw this great thing saying we think as human beings that we see the world as uh, wrong and right, right and wrong. Yeah, but what we really see the world as is us versus them. So what you find is you have your little tribe of beliefs and you find people who share those beliefs. And anyone who doesn't have those same beliefs is wrong. So really you're not seeing it as right and wrong. You're seeing it as us versus them. And I think what you just highlighted then plays into that quite nicely. Um, so relationship building, let's say I'm going to start a business tomorrow and it's in the B2B space and relationship building is the thing that I want to focus on because as you say, the robots are taking over and they can't build relationships, not like we can. So how would I map out a relationship building strategy for my target audience? What would you advise? I say take 10 to 20 people in your immediate network typically more professional connections and not personal connections because the people closest to you are the ones who usually poo poo on you the most. You know what I mean? Why is that for another day? Take 10 to 20 people and do discovery calls. You can offer to buy them coffee or whatever for their time. Most of them will say no, thank you anyway, but you'll send them a gift after, but just set up calls, have conversations, ask them, Tell them that you're planning on doing this. You trust their advice, their opinion. Give them your information about this business that you're building, this software that you're, whatever it is. And then um, kind of let them in on little secrets here and there. Ask them what they want. They're going to tell you, because a lot of times we have an idea. Here's this business I want to build, right? But then if we start talking to our our ideal clients and our community and our circle, they're going to give us some good ideas. And if you hear the same common pains and challenges and issues or whatever you want to call them in five, six, seven of these calls that you're having, that might add into what you offer. This might be like another piece or something that you didn't see, an angle that you didn't see. I always ask them what they'd be willing to pay. They're always going to lowball you. <laughs> and then we tell them at the end, Hey, listen, um, I'm going to launch this soon. Thank you so much. This really means a lot to me. I really value your opinion and I'll let you know when I launch it, you'll be one of the first people I tell. And people just, they're here for it. They want to be in on a secret. They want to be in on what you're doing. They want to know. Everybody just wants to know, right? And now you're bringing them into the fold. You're creating an evangelist for you, if nothing else, but a potential client as well. And- no you're boosting your product or your offering or whatever that is. Nice. And nothing is a silver bullet, right? There's no one strategy that is going to be a hundred percent perfect. So what, what, what is the con with the relationship building? Where do you have to be careful? Um, giving too much personal information. I think like sometimes people kind of, there's like a boundary at some point, right? giving or getting too much personal information that ruins a business relationship. I mean, I, there's, there's definitely some cautionary tales there, I'm sure. But the other, the other thing is like what we were talking about earlier with the time and the limits. Um, I always, you know, I open up a Slack channel with a lot of my clients 
but I got a slack this Sunday at two o'clock in the afternoon and I turn off all my notifications. I let everyone know. I think a, a lot of it is managing expectations. Hey, listen, I'm going to return slack during business hours. Um, and I just say it right up front or, Hey, listen, you can, you have my number. You can call me, you can text me. I try to really prioritize the limited amount of time I spend with my family on nights and weekends. So I'll return any messages in business hours. You just give me a few minutes. If it's really urgent, go ahead and call me again. I think 90% of our problems could be solved by just managing expectations better. I agree. I think expectations are the root of happiness and all evil. And I think me, me and Zach have definitely had that conversation of, I'll get a big email through at seven o'clock and I'll be like, oh my God, Zach, I've had this email. It's like, it's not life or death. We work in business. Nobody can, there's no situation like 99% of the time where it's like, that can wait until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Don't stress about it. Um, Leslie, I'm going to ask you a direct question if that's okay. Potentially. I'll let you know. <laughs> Would you say you're a social seller? Um, by social seller, do you mean using social channels to sell? Or do you mean like relationship social seller? Great question. Great clarification question. I would say the former, more so leaning into using social channels to sell. Um, social is definitely part of my strategy, but it is not the whole thing. I, I'm not like purely social. I, I get, you never know. It's like where, where, if I needed to get a hold of you right now, where would I find you? Email, phone call, text, LinkedIn, Reddit. Where am I going to find you guys? The podcast. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Zach said, yeah, right here. Right here, baby. Yeah. How yeah. Do I message uh, your podcast? I uh, that yeah. I, I would say LinkedIn is probably, you, you'll probably get a quick reply on LinkedIn or email than WhatsApp, text, or maybe, but, but if, you, if you're going to call me, depends. Depends who I'm in a meeting with. I might reply to a message in a meeting, yeah. but I won't answer a call in a meeting. Is that the right answer? I think I was I was asking you. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> You've ticked that you're a great salesperson, Leslie. You've reversed the table. Um, but I'm just saying we all have different methods that we like to communicate hmm. with. So when I'm reaching out to Zach and I'm trying to get his attention as a prospect of mine, I don't know if we haven't spoken before. I don't know what his method is. You have, you've got friends who like, they won't respond to a text message, but if you call them, they'll pick up or vice versa. Or like you send a voice note and they'll answer, but you send three texts and they don't, you know, there's all, everyone likes their own form of communication. So I try to be in as many different channels as possible. And however they respond to me, I'll stay on that channel unless they tell me otherwise. Mm. Would, would you say there's certain personas that should steer away from certain channels? Because I, obviously I know Zach very well, and I know that if somebody tries to build a relationship with him, depends who it is, Leslie, I'm sure if you tried to build a relationship with him, he might be open to it. He's a nice guy. But I know any the, the majority of sellers that try to have small talk and, and chit-chat with Zach, they're not going to get it. He doesn't want a relationship wants to shut his laptop at 5.30 and go home. I'm not really, Is that fair to say? I'm terrible about it as well. I'm like, look, mate, let's cut all Get to out. the bit. Let's get, let's get straight to it. Okay. Have you done the DISC assessment, D-I-S-C? Not personally. I'm aware of it, like a high D type of Are personality. Are you? Or have you just been told that? I've been called worse, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's actually a really cool plugin. I'm not sponsored by them, but Crystal knows if you hear me right now. I'm just kidding. Um, but you could sponsor me. That would be great. Crystal knows K-N-O-W-S. And they are a LinkedIn plugin. It like sits on your browser. It's just a browser extension. They have a free version and a paid version. But um, 
it tells you like the personality of the person whose profile you're on. And if you get the free version, you get 10 free a month. I use this all the time. So if I pull up Zach's profile, it tells me he's a high D and usually that's a lot of your executive level people. They're typically high D or maybe a high D with a little I. Um, and you're, you're going to want to be more direct. You're going to be more like, do you like bullet points, Zach? Like here, I want these three things and I want it short and sweet, get straight to the point and get out. I always do a little bit of research and that's one of my favorite things. I've had maybe a couple people who've looked at it with me over the course of the last 10 years, tell me that it was incorrect. I worked for one of them and he was just wrong. <laughs> it was like spot on his personality. Thumbs up to that. Um, and I think like being able to know your audience and who you're talking to is really important. A lot of times when you're cold calling, cold emailing, you don't have those insights. So some of those tools are kind of cool to throw in there and to use. Um, but yeah, like executives, typically not so much on the small talk. Um, engineers typically not so much on the small talk unless you can get them to open up and vent to you about something going on in their organization. Healthcare typically not so much about the small talk. Yeah. But there's always an exception to the rule. Right, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> I love small talk and a coffee. I love it. Yeah, Jack's the opposite. That was actually one of the strategic hiring decisions around bringing Jack into the business outside of him being my friend for so long. Um, but he's the total opposite personality type to me. So Jack is like the life and soul of the party. He's got thousands of friends. He doesn't know any of them very well. There's no depth to his personality. He's not a good person. <laughs> he's actually, I don't trust him. But outside of that, um, yeah, the relationship builder part probably is more so Jack than me. So we could probably talk to you all day, Leslie, but we are coming close to the end. So let's try some rapid fire questions. Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. So what's your favorite sales or marketing book that if you could only pick one, you would advise everyone read? Ooh. Um, I'd say it's actually crucial conversations. So it's kind of a leadership book, but I think it's actually pertains a lot to the sales process. I'm a big fan. Nice. Favorite sales question. <laughs> Curious. Why do you ask? Um, <laughs> no, I usually, <laughs> I usually say, uh, can you tell me a little more about that? It's my favorite. Nice. Nice. And if you could go back to Leslie at the start of her career, what advice would you give her that you wish you knew then that would have made all the difference? Um, your professional personality does not need to be a character. I think I would say that. And um, I thought that I had to show up at work as put together professional Leslie and use big words and, you know, make sure that I wasn't showing too much of who I really am. My sales, I mean, I can't even tell you the exponential factor that it changed when I just leaned into being who I am and not always listening to, you know, the buttoned up version, not like, like putting things on the table, being human. It matters so much people respect it and people are human in return amazing amazing and if people want to find more of you learn more about you follow you watch your show where can they do all those things you can find me i'm leslie douglas on linkedin i think it's backslash leslie b douglas and um our show we have a daily sales show live at sellbetter.xyz beautiful Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you Leslie. Guys.